The biggest hurdle in building a DIY robot actuator is heat. Every time the motor windings and ESC run, they keep pumping out more of it. And if you can't get that heat away fast enough, long duration operation is off the table. In this design, I've tucked the ESC right inside the stator windings, merging the two main heat sources into one and cooling them with active airflow and just a handful of metal parts. The result, even after lifting 6.9 Nimun for a full hour, the internal temperature tops out at only 42 degrees Celsius, leaving plenty of thermal headroom. In this video, I'll walk you through the design philosophy, the build, and the performance tests. First, let me show you the actuator I designed previously. It swaps a planetary gearbox for a cycloidal reducer, but otherwise it's built almost exactly like a commercial robot actuator. The reduction mechanism sits inside the stator. Radial magnets are embedded in the rotor and the ESC's magnetic encoder reads that rotation. Everything is held together by an aluminum housing, which doubles as a heatsink, pulling heat from both the stator windings and the ESC straight out to the air. Motor, reducer, ESC, and cooling are all seamlessly integrated, giving an excellent balance of power, size, and thermal performance. For a DIY build, though, this layout isn't always ideal. I want to use as many 3D printed plastic parts as possible. Metal is expensive, so I want to keep its use to a minimum. But plastic can't carry away heat from the windings or the ESC. The thermal path to the outside world has to be aluminum. That means the real challenge in DIY is to create an efficient heat path with as little metal as possible. From that viewpoint, the conventional layout isn't the best fit for DIY. The windings and the ESC sit on opposite sides of the rotor, so giving each a separate heat path would force you to build almost the whole structure out of metal. This time, I've moved the ESC inside the motor windings. By clustering both heat sources together, the system sheds heat efficiently while keeping the amount of metal to an absolute minimum. Because those two sources still pump out a lot of heat, I accelerate the process with active cooling. There's another bonus. The reduction stage is no longer hemmed in by the stator or rotor, so I can build a larger, stronger mechanism out of plastic alone. And since the rotor is flipped, the reducer is supported at two points instead of one, which dramatically boosts stiffness against side loads. If you look at the new actuator, you'll notice it's really just two blocks. A metal core that houses the motor and handles the heat, and a swappable plastic block that contains the reduction mechanism. The metal section stays the same. Trade out the plastic piece and you can change the gearbox in minutes. For now, I'm using a cycloidal reducer, but the same interface could host a linear actuator or anything else I dream up down the road. All right, let's dive into the build. Thanks to this video's sponsor, JLC3DP, getting hold of high-quality 3D printed parts couldn't be easier. Just follow the link in the description to my GitHub page, download the zip file, unzip it, and drag the included model straight onto the JLC3DP website, then hit order and you're done. JLC3DP, the future of manufacturing with advanced 3D printing services. Their streamlined online platform allows for easy upload of 3D models, instant quotes, and real-time order tracking. From material selection to the speedy delivery of final products, they meticulously manage every step with production times as fast as 24 hours and delivery within just two days. As a new JLC3DP user, you can grab coupons worth up to 70 USD. Check out what JLC3DP can do for you at the link in the description. The parts arrived about 10 days after I placed the order. I've been using JLC3DP for about a year now, and their quality impresses me every single time. There's no warping at all. The finish is always clean and beautiful. I highly recommend trying JLC3DP for your next project. All right, let's start the assembly. First, I'll wind the coils onto the stator. I'm using four strands of 26AWG wire in parallel. For details on how to wind the coils, check the link in the description. With that, the stator is ready. Next, I'll move on to building the rotor. Everything is assembled using adhesive. This metal ring is made of a ferromagnetic material. It helps guide the rotor's magnetic flux back through the magnetic circuit instead of letting it leak into the air. This improves flux density in the stator and increases torque. In the previous version, I used a 10 millimeter thick stator. This time I'm using a 20 millimeter thick one, so I'm placing two magnets side by side. This effectively doubles the torque. Now the rotor is finished. Next, I'll work on the metal core. First, I press fit the bearings using a bit of determination. Next, I'll assemble the stator, active cooler, and FOC driver into the metal core. The 
The thermal pad transfers heat from the FOC driver to the metal core. For more details on this custom FOC driver, check out the video linked here. Finally, once the rotor is installed, the metal core section is complete. Let's do a quick test. Looks like it's spinning correctly. Finally, I'll build the reduction block. This time, the gear ratio is 9 to 1. And with that, the reduction block is complete. Finally, combining the metal core with the reduction block completes the build. It's running smoothly, that completes the assembly. Next, let's move on to testing. First, I'll check whether the FOC control is working correctly. As you can see, ID stays at zero and IQ is tracking IQF correctly. However, when spinning at high speed under no load, the tracking isn't as clean. Next is position control. I'm stopping the motor every 45 degrees. It's tracking the target angles quickly and accurately. If you smoothly change the target position instead of using step signals, you can reduce the load on the actuator and minimize vibration in the robot. This technique is called a velocity trapezoidal profile. As you can see, it can perform position control quietly like this. Next is the lifting test. It can easily lift 6.86 Newton meters without any problem. This is 13.72 Newton meters, twice as much as before. It still handles it with ease. I didn't have a way to measure higher torque with the tools I had on hand, so I'll save the maximum torque test for another time. Next, let's test the maximum rotational speed. There was a difference in the maximum speed depending on the direction of rotation. Finally, let's test whether the cooling works properly during continuous operation. I ran the actuator at 6.86 Newton meters for one hour. As a result, the temperature sensor attached to the FOC driver measured 42 degrees Celsius. It looks like there's still plenty of thermal headroom. I also tested the effect of the active cooler by turning it off and running the actuator for one hour. 
As a result, the internal temperature reached 68 degrees Celsius. It's clear that the active cooler is highly effective. After running for a long time, the actuator started making unusual noises. Let's take it apart and find out what's causing it. It turns out that all of the output bushings have cracked. It looks like this part should be made of metal instead. No major issues were found with the other parts. All right, there's still plenty to refine, but this project has taken me a big step closer to a truly practical DIY robot actuator. Next up, I'll be working on tougher and quieter gearing, a faster FOC control loop, easier assembly, and better cost optimization. I plan to share all those upgrades in future videos, so hit that subscribe button and stay tuned. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.